Take your Bibles with me today and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Today we're dealing with uh, a difficult passage of Scripture. Uh, This is one of those passages, quite frankly, as a pastor, I would have just as soon bounced over. You know, you come to some of these, these difficult, problematic passages, and sometimes you think it'd be good just to bounce right over that and just not deal with that. This is one of those passages, and yet we're going to try our best to be true uh, to the Word of God. It's not our responsibility to choose what part of Scripture to teach. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all Scripture is applicable to us, and so we want to be faithful in teaching all of Scripture. And so in just a few moments, we'll dig into the chapter. Let me ask you those we begin. Are you an organized person or an unorganized person? Let me just kind of pool the congregation today. How many of you would say that you are organized? Let me see your hands, all right? All right. How many would say that you are unorganized? All right, looks like some people raised their hands twice, all right? And, and, and I say that on purpose because I'm kind of the same way. As I was thinking about myself, I kind of wrote down in my notes, I'm kind of a mixed breed when it comes to that because there are certain parts of my life that are extremely organized. For example, um, my schedule is extremely organized. I do not like anything to be out of sorts. I like to know you know, what, you know, what we're going to do today, what we're going to do tomorrow, what we're going to do the next day. Uh, that's why a week like this, God does on purpose to kind of get me out of my comfort zone just a little bit. When we go on vacation, I plan every aspect of our vacation. You know, you know. here's where we're stopping for the night. Vicki, here's where we're going to use the restroom. You don't have to use the restroom before or after. All right, I meticulously plan every part of the trip. I'm organized when it comes to my schedule. But I'm unorganized when it comes to my desk. If you walk in my office, you'd look at my desk and say, my word, Brian, how is it that you get anything done? Your desk is just kind of an unorganized mess. I don't know, that's just the way I I am. God, though, is a God of order. God is a God of organization. God is not dysfunctional. God is not unorganized. As a matter of fact, and this isn't where we're going today, but but the sovereignty of God tells us that everything from eternity past to eternity future is meticulously planned by God. You've heard me say over and over again, you know, some of the words that you'll never hear come out of God's mouth is, oops, how did that happen? Why? Because God knows everything that is going to take place. My Argentine pastor friend always uses the phrase, todo está friamente calculado. Everything is coldly, meticulously calculated. That's certainly true with God. Think with me today. We see God's order in the universe. The the precision of of the universe is so amazing. Our planet is so finely tuned for human life that if, if the oxygen levels vary just a little bit, if we were a few miles further away from the sun or closer to the sun, we could not exist. Scientists call that the anthropic principle, how, how God meticulously has organized and created our universe. We see God's order in our bodies. Man, we've seen that just listening to the doctors with Amber this last week, just a couple of things that I read this week. Did you know that a fetus, you know, that little fetus inside the mother's womb acquires fingerprints at just three months of age? So three months after, you know, that seed has fertilized the egg, that little fetus already has fingerprints, already has DNA. Did you know that your small intestines are four times your height? You sit back and say, Brian, why are they called your small intestines? I don't know. Ask whoever did that. But your small intestines wrap around and around and around, and they're four times your height. How meticulous, how cool is that? They say that nerve impulses travel to and from your brain at the speed of 170 miles an hour. 
Yes, in our bodies, we see God's order, the fact that God is a God of precision. We see that in our lives as well. I'm reminded of the words of the psalmist in Psalm 23. The steps of a man are established by God. God is in charge. God is a God of order. Now, now think with me today. God is not just a God of order in the universe. He's not just a God of order in our bodies. And he's not just a God of order in our lives. But God is a God of order in the church as well. God is a God of order in our families as well. And that is what the Apostle Paul is dealing with in today's passage. He is talking about order in the church. We're in the middle of a series that we've called Scandalous Church in which the Apostle Paul is addressing the church at Corinth and he's dealing with scandalous, he's dealing with certain problem areas that were existent within the church of Corinth and the Apostle Paul is dealing with these things trying to put them in order. Why is that? Because God is a God of order. So today we look at God's divine order. And so take your Bibles. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I actually want to read one verse from chapter 10, and then we'll jump into chapter 11. Notice verse 31 in chapter 10. We've referred to it several times. Paul says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Jump down to chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Jesus Christ. We'll see that at the end of the message. Verse two, Paul says, now I commend you, Corinthians, because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions, the teaching, even as I delivered them to you. Paul says in verse three, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. We'll pause there. We'll keep reading in just a few moments. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for meeting with us today. Help us to realize that you are here this morning. We don't have to beg for you to come. We don't have to sit back in anticipation waiting to see whether you are going to show up. You promise that wherever, whenever your people meet together, you are in the midst of them. So Father, I pray today that you'd help us to sense your presence. I pray that you would speak to us corporately, but I also pray that you would speak to us individually. Lord, help us to understand this passage of scripture. Lord, I admit it's a difficult one. And Father, there's things that are going to be difficult to understand and difficult to explain. But we're so glad that you've given us the Holy Spirit, who is our great teacher. So Lord, I pray today that he would teach us. Help us to pull some truths from, from this passage that we can apply to our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see Jesus. Help us to see the gospel, Lord, even in these verses that we are studying this morning. And we thank you for what you're going to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I admit this morning that today's passage is not a popular one. Not necessarily the verses we've read, but verses we're probably gonna read in in just a few moments. Uh, The verses that we're gonna study today could be, would be, are, defined as counter-cultural. By that, uh, to a certain degree, we're swimming upstream today. We're kind of going against the cultural flow. As I mentioned, this is one of those scriptural texts that, that quite frankly, I would rather bounce over. I would much rather get to chapter 12 that talks about the fact that we're one body and we're unified together. Uh, It would be much easier to address those truths than some of the truths that are found in these verses. Yet, quite frankly, we are commanded, we are compelled, and we are challenged to teach all of scripture. So we're going to do that this morning. Let me make a few statements before we begin to kind of encapsulate what the Apostle Paul is saying. The first is this, it's in your outlines. 
our society has gone through is going through a massive restructuring of morals and values. Let me say that again. I kind of want that to sink in. Our society is going through a massive restructuring of morals and values. For hundreds of years, the Bible was considered the source of truth. And the Bible was considered the basis of our beliefs and our practices. Sadly, that is no longer the case. Whenever the Bible conflicts with culture, the Bible is now characterized as being old-fashioned and outdated. Uh, You see it and you hear it on the news at times. And so as believers, we need to realize that that we're not always, we're not always going to be in sync with culture. There are going to be times that we're going to be out of sync with culture, and we need to make a decision. What is the foundation for our truth? Is it culture or is it the Word of God? The second thing that I would say is this, because Paul deals with it in this passage. Our roles need to be defined by what God says in his word and not by our culture, all right? Whether those are roles within the home, whether those are roles within the church, God specifically and clearly deals with those roles. We must not allow cultural influences to supersede the truth of Scripture. Let me say that again because I think somebody ought to say an amen when I say that, all right? We must not allow cultural values to supersede the truth of Scripture. Do you believe that this morning, all right? That's true for our families, and that is true for the church as well. I'm afraid that all too often we have allowed political correctness to define what we believe. And we have allowed political correctness to define even how we function. As believers, we cannot do that. We must know what we believe, and we must not waver in those beliefs. As I was thinking through this this week, I was reminded of an old hymn that some of you probably sang uh, years ago. It goes like this. I won't sing it, but it goes like this. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal, and they grow glow with a light sublime. I say that because I want you to know the day that the Bible is relevant for our culture. The Bible is not outdated. And in God's word, we find the source of truth. We find everything that we need to live and to operate and to function and to be successful. Having said all of that, I say that because within the passage, the apostle Paul, to a certain degree, is dealing with cultural issues, some cultural issues that might not apply to us, but but the longstanding principles do. Now, if you look in your Bibles, whether you have a a literal Bible or whether you have it on a tablet or an iPhone, uh, look in your Bibles. The passage, the paragraph, actually begins in verse 2. I know the chapter begins in verse 1 where Paul says, be imitators of me even as I am of Jesus Christ that 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 sentence actually ends the last paragraph and a new paragraph begins in verse 2 and notice verse 2 once again Paul says to the Corinthians he says I commend you because you remember and maintain the traditions that I delivered to you the word traditions there doesn't necessarily mean you know um you know, what the, the way they celebrated Christmas and, you know, all of their cultural things. It's talking about their beliefs. The Apostle Paul is telling the church of Corinth, he says, now, I know I'm criticizing you for a lot of things. He said, but let me commend you that you have maintained the traditions, you have maintained the beliefs that I passed on to you. I say that, and Paul says that for this reason. The scandal of Corinth was not a doctrinal scandal. Let me say that again. The scandal of Corinth was not a doctrinal scandal. It was a practical one. The Corinthians were solid in their beliefs. 
It was the practical application of those beliefs that caused them problems. They still believed in the divinity of Jesus. They still believed in salvation by grace through faith. Doctrinally, they were solid, but practically, as we are seeing in the passage, they were a mess. Now, let me pause for a second because that's a great application for you and I because you and I, we can be orthodox in our beliefs. We can be solid in our orthodoxy, but we can be weak in what we call our orthopraxy. Um, We can be solid in what we believe, and we can be very weak in the way we live out those beliefs on a regular basis. Let me explain what I mean. I meet people all the time that know what they believe. They come in my office, and their life is an absolute mess. And I sit back and say, okay, let's start with the principles. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe this. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe this. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe this. They are solid in their beliefs, but they're messed up in putting those beliefs into practice. That's what the Apostle Paul was telling the Corinthians. He said, you know what? I commend you because you maintain the beliefs that I have passed on to you. The problem is not in what you believe. The problem is how you are living out those beliefs. So let me, let me just pause for a second and ask you. Have your beliefs transformed your actions? Have your beliefs changed the way you live, the way you talk, the way you think, the way you function, because orthodoxy should demonstrate itself in orthopraxy. What we believe should be lived out in our everyday lives. Let me just say this. I could pause here and, and, and preach for a long time. One of the reasons that the world is not attracted to the gospel is because I am afraid we as Christians do not live out what we believe. We say we believe this on Sunday, but our life from Monday to Friday is completely different. And the world looks at us and says, why would I want what you have because your beliefs are not transforming the way that you live? And so that was the scandal of Corinth. The scandal of Corinth was that their beliefs were right. But their life was a disaster. And the way that they were operating ministry was a disaster as well. Now, as we come to verse 3, all of that was introduction, by the way. As we come to verse 3, we see several things that I want you to see. The first is this. If you're following along in your outline, it's this. God is a God of order. God is a God of order. Just as his creation is meticulously ordered, so are God's designs for authority, for leadership, and for worship as well. And so as we come to verse 3, we find that God clearly defines his order of leadership. If you're following along in your outline, it simply says this, the Bible clearly defines God's order of leadership. Let me pause and illustrate what I'm talking about. Here at Hollywood Community Church, we're a little bit of a a larger organization. We have a church and we have a school and we have a lot of different ministries. And so several years ago, we thought it was necessary to sit back and make an organizational chart And so we know, you know, what is the flow of decision-making? What is the flow of leadership? And so we have an organizational chart. If we could put our organizational chart up there, you might not see all of those little blocks, but all of those little blocks have people's names and different functions. And if you could see, we are led by an elder board. We believe that's a New Testament model. And so we have an elder board, and, and the pastor is underneath that. Then, then you have different elders that have responsibilities and different staff members that have responsibilities underneath um, each of those. Now, I want you to see that for a reason. I want you to understand, because even though people are in different places of leadership, and some might have more authority and decision-making in others, none of that indicates that one person has any more value than another person. 
I, I want you to catch that, all right? Different responsibilities, but all of us have the exact same value, whether it's the person who is the senior pastor or whether it's a, a deacon or another staff member or whether it's somebody that's working in our facilities. All of us have different functions, but in the eyes of God, all of us are equal. Do we understand that? And so that's one of the things that the Apostle Paul is describing. In verse 3, we see God's organizational charts. In other words, if God was going to diagram and say, okay, here is, here is the way things are organized. Here is my organizational chart. Read verse 3 again with me. If you have it, I'm not sure whether we'll put it up on the screens again. But here is verse 3. Paul says this, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Now, 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 now let's kind of flesh that out, and let me give you some things to fill in in your notes, because the Apostle Paul, let me invert it just a little bit, because here's what Paul says. Paul says, first of all, Christ, or excuse me, God is the head of Christ. I'll talk about what that means in just a moment. The second thing he says is that Christ is the head of man. And the third thing that he says is that man or the husband is the head of the woman or of the wife. Now, the word head in the passage is used as a metaphor and it expresses the idea of leadership. It expresses the idea of authority. Now, be careful to note that the authority and as a result, the subordination mentioned in the passage are not referring to essence. They're not referring to the character of the person, but rather they're referring to function. So, so let me say it another way that, that might be clear if you're following in your notes. God's order of leadership does not mean that one person has more value than another. I want you to catch that. God's order of leadership does not mean that one person has more value than another. And, and he actually gives two illustrations in the passage that perfectly illustrate that. And I want us to see these two illustrations. Notice, notice the second one first because he says, the head of Christ is God. All right? So, so the head of of Jesus Christ, God the Son, is God, God the Father. Now, think with me. Put your thinking caps on. Are you ready to think this morning? All right. Does that mean that God the Father has more value or is more important than Jesus Christ? Does that mean that God the Father is more powerful than Jesus Christ? I'm not getting an answer. No. No. Does that mean that God the Father is more compassionate than Jesus Christ? Does that mean that God the Father has more authority and therefore he's able to exert that authority over Jesus Christ? He's more powerful and he was able to subordinate Jesus Christ. And so God the Father is in charge and God the Son is submissive to that. Is that what that means? No, it doesn't mean that. The answer is no to all of those questions. God the Father and God the Son are 100% equal. Let me say that again. God the Father and God the Son are 100% equal. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10 and verse 30. He said, I and the Father are one. God the Father and I are completely united. So, so here's the illustration, and I want you to catch this. The illustration that Paul is giving is this. In the Trinity, Jesus is submissive to the Father in function, but equal in essence. In the Trinity, Jesus is submissive to God the Father in function, but he's equal to him in essence. Okay, here's what Jesus said. In John chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus said, I am come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. All right? Here's what Jesus is saying. In, in my role as God the Son, 
in my role as the Savior of the world, in my role as Redeemer, I willingly in function submit myself to the authority of the Father. Even though I am completely equal to Him in every single way, all right, in function, I submit myself to Him. There's a second illustration that, that the Apostle Paul uses in the passage. The second illustration is that of marriage. And Paul in the passage says, the head of every wife is her husband. Paul re reiterates that in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, where he says this, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself the Savior. So let me ask you, same question we asked about the relationship in the Trinity with God the Father and God the Son. Does the fact that the husband is the head of the wife mean that the wife is of any less value? Does it mean that the wife has less intellect? Does it mean that the wife has less significance than the husband? Of course not. Uh, Vicky is better at me or better than me at almost everything we do. She's, she's smarter than I am. She's certainly prettier than I am. She's, she's more talented than I am. I was sitting back thinking the other day, what are the few things that I can do better than her? And I want you to know, I can beat her at arm wrestling, all right? I do know that. I can beat Vicky at arm wrestling, but other than that, I mean, she is more qualified than me at just about everything else that we do. And so when the Apostle Paul says that the head of the wife is the husband, the Apostle Paul is not saying that's because the husband is superior to the wife. That's because the husband is smarter than the wife. That's because the husband is more talented. No, within marriage, God has established those roles. Just, why, just like in the Trinity, and I think one of the greatest illustrations of the marriage relationship is the Trinity relationship. And so if you're following along in your notes, Paul is saying this, in the home, the wife is submissive to the husband in function, but equal in essence. Let me say it again. In the home, the wife is submissive to the husband in function, but she is absolutely equal in essence. Here's the simple truth. There can only be one head. A two-headed creature is a monster. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, the husband leads and the wife responds to the husband's leadership. Now, now I know that sounds authoritarian. I know that sounds Victorian. I know that sounds antiquated. But you got to understand biblical leadership because biblical leadership is not dictatorial leadership biblical leadership is servant leadership Jesus illustrated it this way in John chapter 13 remember he was meeting with the disciples in the upper room before he went to Golga before he went to Gethsemane and then he went to the cross the disciples were there ready to partake of the um, the Passover and Jesus gets up from the table, lays aside his garment, grabs a bowl, a basin, and grabs a towel and begins to wash the disciples' feet. I've tried in my mind to illustrate, you know, how that all played out because the disciples in their pride didn't want to wash each other's feet. I get it. I hate feet. I mean, I wouldn't want to wash anybody else's feet either. If I was in an upper room with 11 other guys that had dirty, stinky feet, I'd sit back and say, I ain't washing your feet, man. If anybody's washing feet, you're washing mine. And so the disciples kind of sat there waiting to see who was going to pick up the basin and the towel when Jesus does it. And can you imagine the protest in the minds and the hearts of the disciples? Peter expressed it as Jesus came to Peter. Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet and Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then I have no part in you whatsoever, or you have no part in me whatsoever. And then Peter, you know, the pendulum effect, one extreme to the other, but then don't wash my feet, wash my whole body, wash everything. Jesus washes the disciples' feet, goes over, lays aside the basin, lays aside the towel, 
puts his robe back on and comes back and he tells the disciples this. I being your Lord and master have washed your feet. You go do as I have done to you. Now the challenge I don't believe in the passage is to wash each other's feet. I know there's churches that, that, that have foot washing as an ordinance. We kind of talk, call them foot washing Baptists. We don't, we don't practice that as an ordinance like baptism or the Lord's Supper. I believe here is the exhortation. A true leader serves. And so when God says that the husband is the head of the wife, the idea is not that he's the boss. He comes home, sits in the lounge chair, grabs the TV remote, and starts barking off orders. And the wife has to do everything that he says. The idea is that the husband lovingly serves his wife. And as he lovingly serves him, she responds to his leadership. Because Paul says, husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How does Christ love us? Not in a dictatorial way, but in a completely servant-hearted, sacrificial way. You see, God has an order of leadership. And, And we've allowed our culture to mess that up in our minds, to paint it, to be something that it is not. And God is clear in Scripture. Now, notice the second thing. Let me go quickly. We still have a lot of ground to cover. The second thing Paul says is this. God's order of leadership is evidenced in the church. God's order of leadership is evidenced in the church. Notice verses 4 and 5. Here's what Paul says. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Let's pause there. We'll, We'll keep reading in just a few moments. Let me try to flesh that out, okay? Difficult to understand in our culture, all right? Here's what Paul is saying. Both men and women are involved in worship. It says when men are praying and when women are praying, when men are prophesying and when women are prophesying, the word prophesying here, I personally don't believe is instructional teaching, but it's it's sharing, it's participating, it's, it's communicating in worship as well. Here's what Paul says. Paul says that whenever men are involved in worship, they should worship with their heads uncovered. And when women are involved in worship, they should worship with their heads covered or their heads veiled. Now, quite frankly, in our culture, that doesn't mean much. You and I read that, and if you're like me, you read that and you think, huh? (laughs) I mean, what in the world is the Apostle Paul talking about? But in first century Roman culture, it meant so much more because the only women who had their heads uncovered, who had their heads unveiled, were prostitutes in the Roman culture, all right? So so here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, as women who are participating in worship, whether praying or prophesying, if you are doing that with your heads uncovered, you're committing two errors, Paul says. The first error is this. You're failing to recognize the God-given authority protection of your husband over you and you're wanting to break out of that. And secondly, you are dressing and acting like worldly women. You, You are dressing, you are coming to worship dressed like the women of the world. Now let me answer a question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind right now. You're probably sitting back saying, okay, Brian, what are you saying? Are we establishing a new doctrine here? Now are we saying that every lady needs to come to church with her head veiled or with a hat on? Remember years ago in the 50s how all the ladies wore these big hats to church and all of that? Are you saying, okay, Brian, do we got to get back to all the ladies now are wearing big hats? I don't believe so. There's some churches that believe that and ladies come in and they actually cover their heads. They, they veil their heads. I, I, I don't believe that's the principle that the Apostle Paul is giving in the passage. I do believe that there's two applications, and God knows my heart, we've prayed through this all week long. I believe there's two applications. The first 
probably would be addressed more to women. The secondly would, second one would be addressed, or addressed to men. The first is this. God's order of leadership is evidenced by the way that we dress. God's order of leadership is evidenced by the way we dress. The Corinthian culture, or in the Corinthian culture, the ladies were dressing immodestly. Their, their dress, even in the church, they were coming to church, and their dress by being unveiled. I know to us that seems so innocuous. It seems so innocent to us. Our culture is so different. But imagine yourself being in a Middle Eastern culture in which every lady always went out in public with their head dressed to demonstrate their modesty and to demonstrate their reverence for their husband. And all of a sudden, within the church... Ladies begin unveiling themselves. Now, now the reason for this was because the Apostle Paul was teaching something that was brand new. You see, in first century culture, the lady was not equal to the man. And the Apostle Paul had been teaching that in everything, when God looks at us, he doesn't see Jew nor Greek. He doesn't see man nor woman. In God's eyes, men and women are equal. Can I have a lady say amen? In God's eyes, men and women are equal. But the people in the church began taking that just farther. Well, if we're equal then, then here's what I'm going to do. And they began exhibiting themselves and dressing themselves in a way that in their culture was immodest. It was worldly. It was presumptuous. And the apostle Paul says sinful as well. So, so how do we apply that? We certainly don't apply that saying, ladies, start wearing a veil to church. Now, if God lays that on your heart, that's between you and the Lord. Vicki doesn't feel led to be that way, and, and I certainly don't feel led to ask her to do that. But ladies, let me ask you this. Are you dressing in a way that brings focus to yourself? Are you dressing in a way that puts focus on God? Because what the Corinthian ladies was doing, it was drawing attention to them. And Paul was saying, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. Quit drawing attention to you. And I could go there, I'll let Vicki and some of the ladies address this with our ladies, but in our culture, we live in a way, our late ladies, women dress in a way that accentuates them. It accentuates their bodies. And I believe Paul is saying when we come to worship, certainly any other time, but when we come to worship, we certainly should dress in a way that takes the focus off of ourselves and puts the focus on Jesus and Jesus alone. God's order of leadership is evidenced by the way that we dress. The second thing is this. This is evidence. God's order of leadership is evidenced by the way that we worship. If the first admonition is given to women, I believe the second one is given to men. Because... Paul goes through and he says, okay, women, make sure that your head is covered. And to men, he says, okay, make sure that your head is uncovered. Okay, here's what he's saying. By leaving our head uncovered, we recognize the spiritual authority that God has given to us as men. And the apostle Paul is telling the men of Corinth, recognize your spiritual authority. Act like men of God. Act like the spiritual leaders in your household. You see, men, whenever we do not take responsibility for that authority in our house, whether it's wearing a covering or not wearing a covering as in first century, or whether it's just standing up and being the spiritual leader in our house and saying like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve God. You see, men, whenever we do not recognize that responsibility, that spiritual authority that God has given to us, we dishonor God. That's what Paul is saying. We dishonor God by failing to demonstrate leadership. Sadly, many wives and mothers have to be the spiritual leaders in their home because men are failing at that responsibility. Guys, let me challenge you. Be a man of God. Be a man of prayer. Be a man of, of faithfulness. Be a man of integrity. 
Be the spiritual leader in your home. By that, uh, I don't mean sit your family down and preach to them on a regular basis. I mean live it. I mean breathe it. I mean you be the one to stand up and say, today's Sunday, we're going to church. You you be the one to stand up and say, as a family, we're going to spend some time and we're going to pray together. You be the spiritual leader in your home. And Paul is saying, whenever men fail to do that, however the culture demonstrates it, God is dishonored. Let's honor God. Third point in your notes. This is just getting good. We're just getting, if you think we've touched on some hot topics, you haven't seen what Paul has dealt with yet. The third thing is this. God intentionally and purposefully designed for men and women to be different. God intentionally and purposefully designed that. Would you read with me beginning in verse six? Notice what Paul says. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. Paul speaking sarcastically. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her head or to shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made for woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, if you sit back and say, okay, Brian, what does that mean because of the angels? That's a great question. That's one of the misunderstood phrases in scripture. There's three points of view. If you're interested in come and talk to me, I'll talk to you about it afterward. Verse 11, nevertheless, In the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. There's an interdependence. We need each other. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, We have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Unique passage of Scripture. As far as I know, this is one of the only passages in Scripture that deal with hairstyles. And so, hairstylists, take note what the Apostle Paul is saying. As we've already mentioned, the idea of the head being covered or uncovered was a demonstration of submission or authority. It was a demonstration of one's gender. The idea being that men and women were supposed to look different. Men and women were supposed to look different in worship, and men and women were supposed to look different in their lifestyles as well. I know this morning I'm walking on a cultural time bomb. I know that. But here I go. I'm walking off the cliff, okay? You'd have to have your head in the stand to know to not know what's taking place in our culture today as far as transgenderism. Our culture is intentionally and quickly abolishing gender differences that were established by God. Let let me say that again. Our culture is intentionally and quickly abolishing gender differences that were established by God. We're being bombarded by the fact that our biology does not determine your gender, all right? Your organs do not determine your gender. You can be a woman on the outside, but a man on the inside. You can be a man on the outside, but a woman on the inside. That's what our culture is telling us. What does God's word say? Remember I said in the very beginning that we're in a cultural shift in which the word of God is being cast aside and we're being asked to make decisions based upon what we think is right and wrong. God's word is clear and that's one of the issues that the apostle Paul is dealing with here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you're following along in your notes, here's what Paul says. Paul says male and female differences were established at creation. He he goes through, he talks about that. In the passage we just read it just a few moments ago, that at creation, that's the way that God made us. Here are two verses, Genesis chapter five, verses one and two. Uh, Right in the beginning of the Bible, it says this. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made them in his likeness. Male and female, he created them. 
and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. Generically named man, individually they were named male and female. Genesis chapter, or excuse me, Mark chapter 10 and verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. All right, let me just state the obvious of what God says in Scripture. God is the one who determines gender. God is the one who determines gender. He never makes a mistake. He never by mistake puts a man in a female's body. And he never by mistake puts a female in a man's body. Male and female differences. Remember he's talking about roles and he's talking about in the church and he's saying we have roles in the church and we have roles in the family. Who is the one that has established those roles? It is God, the one that has established those roles. From the very beginning, he made them male and female. The second thing that he says in the passage is this, male and female differences are seen in nature. Verses 14 and 15, he says, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him, but if a woman has long hair, it's to her glory? Now, now let's be very careful to not use this verse to criticize someone whose hair is longer or shorter than ours. (laughs) Because it's real easy to look at a lady that has short hair and say, oh my word, she's not glorifying God. Or look at a man whose hair is longer than ours and say, oh my word, that man is not glorifying God. Let me just say, there's no diagrams in Scripture as to how long or how short your hair should be. I remember years ago, I was singing in a singing group. I gotta get done, but I was singing in a singing group and we walked in the church and uh, in the church, there was great big pictures of how the men were supposed to cut their hair. And, And it said that it had to be above the ears, be above the ears, and it couldn't be blocked in back. It had to be tapered in back. And we're like, oh my word, where does that come from in Scripture? All right, there's no Bible, there's no diagrams that show that. Here's the principle. Even nature shows that men and women are different. Even nature shows that. Let me show you a couple of illustrations. You ever see male and female cardinals? they look completely different. You ever see male and female lions? They look completely different. You ever see male and female ducks? They look completely different. You ever see male and female deer? They look completely different. Now I know not all the animals are that obvious, but but even in nature it's very clear. I, I don't have any idea what it means, but if you notice, the men are generally the most beautiful, the most colorful. I don't know, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I'm just stating the obvious. You saw it. I'm just stating the obvious. All right? God designed for men and women to be different. And that difference is played out in the home. And that difference is played out in worship as well. Let me show you one more thing in your notes and I'm done. The ultimate goal is to glorify God and to imitate Jesus. Remember in the beginning of this whole passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul says, whatever you do, even in the simple things of eating and drinking, glorify God. So church, let me challenge you today. At work, your ultimate goal is to glorify God. It's not to make money. It's to glorify God. At home, your ultimate goal is to glorify God. At play, our ultimate goal is to glorify God. We should glorify God in everything. And the last is this. We should imitate Christ in everything we do. Now, Paul makes a statement that some would judge as egotistical. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Jesus Christ. Some would sit back and say, man, what an egotistical statement. Paul's saying, be like me. Everybody, be like me. I want you to be like me. Remember the context. Paul is talking about eating meat that is offered to idols, and Paul is talking about, I'm willing to sacrifice my own personal wants for the sake of the gospel. And in the light of that context, Paul says, imitate me, because my ultimate goal is to imitate 
Jesus. Church, let me ask you, what's your ultimate goal? Is it to imitate Jesus? I remember as a little boy, we used to sing this song. I'm not sure I can remember the words. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. My desire to be like him. Is that your desire? You see, in the home, God has a plan. And within those roles, within that plan, my goal more than anything else is to imitate Jesus Christ. In the church, my goal, my responsibility is to imitate Jesus. God has a divine order, a divine order that is so illustrated in the person of Jesus, who though he was God, left the glories of heaven, came to earth, took upon human flesh, humbled himself in the likeness of man, and became obedient unto death. That's why Paul is able to say that God is the head of Christ. And Christ is the head of the church. And the husband is the head of the wife. You see, to be like Jesus means that I understand my role. And I understand that whoever I am, wherever I am, there's a godly authority that is over me. And I recognize that. And I submit to that. I submit to God's leadership. Mm-hmm.